All right, so let's get going. Where were we? We were, all right, we were at the point where we started out the course wondering about the structure of the atom, how the electron and the nucleus hung together. And we saw that we could not explain how that nucleus and electron hung together using classical ideas, classical physics, classical uh, mechanics, and uh, classical electromagnetism. And so we put that discussion aside, and we started to talk about the wave-particle duality of light and matter. And we saw that both light and matter can behave as a wave or can behave as a particle. And we needed that discussion in order to come back to talk about the structure of the atom. And in particular, what was so important last time that we met is that we saw the results of an experiment, the Davison, Germer, and Thompson, George Thompson uh, experiment, that demonstrated that mass, a particle, could exhibit wave-like behavior. We saw the interference pattern of electrons reflected from a nickel single crystal. And the actual original paper that uh, reports that result is on our website. You're welcome to uh, take a look at it. But uh, that really was the impetus, this observation of the wave-like behavior of matter. That was the impetus for this gentleman here, Erwin Schrodinger, in 1926-27, to write down an equation of motion for waves. That is, he thought, well, maybe the answer here is that if particles can behave like waves, well, maybe we have to treat the wave-like nature of particles, the wave-like nature of electrons, in particular in the case when the wavelength, the de Broglie wavelength of the particle or the electron is comparable to the size of its environment. Maybe in those cases we have to use a different kind of equation of motion a wave equation of motion, and that's what he did. So he wrote down this equation. We briefly looked at it last time. This equation has some kind of operator called the Hamiltonian operator. It's uh, got a hat on it, a carrot on the top of it that tells us it's an operator that operates on this thing, psi. That psi is what's going to represent our particle. That psi is a wave. Since we're going to give it a functional form in another day or so, we're going to call it a wave function. Somehow that psi represents our particle. Exactly how it represents our particle is something we're going to talk about again in a few days. But right now, the important thing is to realize that this psi represents the presence of a particle, in this case, the electron, okay? And when, psi, when H operates on psi, we get back psi, all right? We do this operation and out comes psi again, the original wave function, but it's multiplied by something. That something is the energy. It's the binding energy. It's the energy with which the electron is bound to the nucleus, all right? So this equation here, it's an equation of motion. This equation, this wave equation, Schrodinger's equation, is to this new kind of mechanics called quantum mechanics, like Newton's equations of motion, and I show you just the second law here, is Newton's equations of motion are to classical mechanics. This equation here tells us how psi changes with position and also with time. Right? It tells us something about where the electron is and also tells us where the electron is as a function of time. It's an equation of motion. And this is what Schrodinger realized is that, well, maybe when the wavelength of a particle is on the order of the size of its environment, you have to treat it with a different equation of motion. You can no longer use F equal ma 
this classical equation of motion, you have to use a different equation of motion. And that's Schrodinger's equation, this wave equation. All right? Could we dim the front lights a little bit? Because the screen's just a little bit hard to see, I think. OK. So we're going to let our uh, electron be represented by this wave, psi. All right? And uh, so psi, since it's going to be re representing the electron, this psi is going to be a function of some position coordinates and also, in the broadest sense, uh, a function of time. Now, we, of course, can label psi in Cartesian coordinates, giving it a x, y, and z. So if I gave you x, y, and z for this electron in this kind of coordinate system, where the nucleus is at the origin of the coordinate system, if I gave you the x, y, and z coordinates, you'd know where the electron was. But it turns out that this problem of the hydrogen atom is uh, really impossible to solve if I use a Cartesian coordinate system. So I'm going to use a spherical coordinate system. All right? How many of you are familiar and have used a spherical coordinate system before? OK, a few of you, not all of you. All right. Well, it's not hard to understand, and it is important that you will understand it. So instead of giving you an x, y, and z to locate this electron, this particle in space, we're going to give you an r, a theta, and a phi. All right? And the definitions of r, theta, and phi are the following. If here's my nucleus at the origin, and here's the electron, r here, r is the distance of that electron from the nucleus. It's just the length of this line right here. All right, so that's one coordinate. A second coordinate is theta. Theta is the angle that this r makes, right, from the z-axis. And then the third coordinate is phi. Phi is the following. If I take that electron and I just drop a perpendicular to the xy plane, and I then draw a line in the xy plane from that point of intersection to the origin, well, the angle that that line makes with the, z, with the x axis here, that's phi. OK? So I'm going to give you an r, a theta, and a phi. r is just the distance of the electron from the nucleus. Theta and phi tell us something about the angular position. And then, as I said, in the largest sense, uh, there's also time. But we'll talk about time uh, a little bit later. All right. So um, psi represents our electron. Now, what does the Schrodinger equation specifically for a hydrogen atom actually look like? This h psi times e psi is the kind of generic Schrodinger equation. And now we've got to write a specific one, one specific for the hydrogen atom. All right? So we need to know what this is, h. That's our Hamiltonian, our operator. All right? And so the operator here for that hydrogen atom is this, all right? It's, it is, what it is, <laughs> is essentially three second derivatives, right? Three second derivatives. One here is with respect to r. A second is a second derivative effectively with respect to theta, and another one the final one is a second derivative with respect to phi. All right? So in other words, if this whole Hamiltonian is operating on psi, what you're going to do is essentially take the first derivative of psi with respect to r, multiply it by r squared, and then take the first derivative with respect to r again and multiply it by 1 over r squared. And add to that, you know, the second derivative of psi, or the first derivative of psi with respect to theta multiplied by sine theta, et cetera, et cetera. All right? You don't have to know this. I'm just showing this to you so you recognize it later on. This is a differential equation. In 1803, you learn how to solve these differential equations. 
And then there's another very important term here. So it's all of this plus this, U of R. Hey, what's U of R? Potential energy of interaction. And the potential energy of interaction, of course, is the Coulomb potential energy, right? Right here, 1 over R dependence. We talked about the Coulomb force. This is the potential energy of interaction that corresponds to the Coulomb force. So that's the specific Schrodinger equation for the hydrogen atom. Now, what we've got to do is we have to solve this equation for the hydrogen atom. Right? And when I say solve this equation, what I mean is we're going to have to find E, these binding energies of the electron to the nucleus. That's part of our goal when we say solve this differential equation, is knowing what E is, is figuring out what E is. <coughs> and, the, and actually, this is what we're going to do today, finding those energies. But then the second goal is to find psi. Right? We want to find what is the functional form of psi that represents the electron in the hydrogen atom. Therefore, we're going to want to find the wave functions for psi. And you know what? Those wave functions are nothing other than what you already sort of know, and that is orbitals. You know, you talked in high school about s orbitals and p orbitals and d orbitals. Hey, those orbitals are nothing other than wave functions, all right? They come from solving Schrodinger's equation for the hydrogen atom. That's where they come from. Now, specifically, the orbital is something called the spatial part of the wave function as opposed to the spin part. But for all intents and purposes, they are the same, all right? So we're actually going to use these terms interchangeably, orbital, wave function, wave function, orbital, all right? Okay. The bottom line is that when you solve Schrodinger's equation for the energy and the wave function, it makes predictions for the energies and the wave functions that agree with our observations, as we're going to see today, in particular for the case of the binding energies of the electron to the <coughs> nucleus. Right? Solving this equation, um, or this equation predicts having a stable hydrogen atom, a hydrogen atom that seemingly lives forever. In contrast to when we use classical equations of motion, when we use classical equations of motion, we got a hydrogen atom that lived for all of 10 to the minus 10 seconds. All right? But here, we finally have some way to understand the stability of the hydrogen atom. It makes, the Schrodinger equation makes predictions that agree with our observations of the world we live in. And therefore, we believe it to be correct. All right? That's it. It agrees with the observations that we make. OK. So uh, let's start. And we're actually not going to solve the equation, as I said. But uh, you will do so if you take 561, which is the quantum course in chemistry, or uh, 804, I think it is, which is a quantum course in physics. Uh, after you take differential equations so that you know how to solve the uh, uh, differential equations. But we're going to write down the solution in particular here for E, the uh, binding energies of the electrons to the, uh, to the nucleus. Okay? So now we're going to need this. All right. So we've got H psi equal E psi. And when we solve that equation, we get the following expression for E, these binding energies. E is equal to 1 over n squared times m e to the fourth over 8 epsilon naught squared times h squared. All right? That's what we get out of it. And there's a minus sign up in front. Now, m. What's m? m is the mass of the electron. What's e? e is the charge on the electron. 
Epsilon naught? Well, epsilon naught is this permittivity of vacuum that we talked about before. It's really just a uh, unit conversion factor here. H, Planck's constant. Here comes Planck's constant again. It is ubiquitous. It's everywhere. Okay? And what we do is that we typically take all of these constants and group them together okay, into another constant that we call the Rydberg constant. And we denote it as a capital R sub capital H. So all of that uh, is equal to R sub H. So this is over N squared minus 1. All right? And the value of R sub H, that Rydberg's constant, and this is something you're going to need to use a lot in the next uh, few weeks, is 2.179.87 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. All right? All right. But you also see in this expression for the binding energies of the electron to the nucleus that there's this N here. What's N? N's an integer. When you solve that differential equation, you find that N has only certain allowed, uh, certain allowed um, values. Right? N can be as low as 1, 2, 3, and hey, N can go all the way up to infinity. N is what we call the principal quantum number. I'm going to explain that a little bit more by looking right now at an energy level diagram. So that's the expression. But now let's uh, plot it out so that uh, we can, um, thanks, let's plot it out so that we can uh, understand what's going on here a little more. All right, so we're going to be plotting this expression as n goes from 1 to infinity. So I have. Uh, the energy axis here, energy is going to be going up in that direction, up. So when n is equal to 1, well, when n is equal to 1, the binding energy of that electron to the nucleus is effectively the Rydberg constant. Here I rounded it off, 2.180 minus 2.180 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. But our expression here says that there can be another binding energy of the electron to the nucleus. It says that n can be equal to 2. And if n is equal to 2, well, then the energy, the binding energy of the electron is a quarter of the Rydberg constant, right? Because it's a Rydberg constant over 2 squared. If n is equal to 3, well, our expression says that the binding energy is minus a ninth of the Rydberg constant. If n is equal to 4, it's minus the 16th of the Rydberg constant. n equal 5, minus 125th. n equal 6, minus 136th. n equal 7, minus 149th. All the way up to n equal infinity. And you know what the value of the binding energy is when n is equal to infinity? Zero. OK. So our equation says that the electron can be bound to the hydrogen, to the nucleus with this much energy, or this much energy, or this much energy, and, the, and so on. But it can't be bound to the nucleus with this much energy, somewhere in between, or this much energy, or that much energy. It has to be exactly this, exactly this, exactly this, exactly this, or so on and so forth. Okay. That's important. What we see here is that the energies, the binding energies of the electron to the nucleus are quantized, right? That that binding energy can only have specific allowed values, right? It doesn't have a continuum uh, of, of values for the binding energy. Yes?
those are identically the same size, but remember, no, no, remember, because this is an operator, right? I left the hat off here. Remember, that was a, we took a second derivative of psi, okay? So you can't cancel this. This is an operator taking the derivative of psi, all right? So you can't just cancel that. This isn't a multiply by on this side. This side is, right? This is E times psi, but not over here. That's really important. Yeah. Okay, so we have these quantization of the allowed uh, binding energies of the electron to the nucleus. Where did that quantization come from? That quantization came from solving the Schrodinger equation. It, come, it drops right out of solving the Schrodinger equation. How does that happen? Well, in differential equations, as you'll see, when you solve a differential equation, what you have to do to solve it so that it is adequately describes your physical situation is you, also, you have to often impose boundary conditions onto the problem, all right? And it's that imposition of boundary conditions that gives you that quantization, right? That's where it comes from mathematically. So in other words, remember one of those angles that I showed you, the phi angle? You can see it would run from 0 to 360 degrees. But you also know if you go 90 degrees beyond 360 degrees, right? Suppose you go to 450 degrees. Well, that should give you the same result as if you had phi equal 90, right? So, what you have to do is you have to cut off your solution at 360 degrees. When you cut off that solution, well, then that gives you, in these differential equations, those boundary, these uh, quantization. That's physically where it comes from, okay? You, again, this is not something you're responsible for, but when you do Diffie-Q later on, 1803, you'll see how that happens. All right. So, um, <laughs> Let's uh, talk some more about these allowed energy levels. When the electron, or when n is equal to 1, what we say, the language we use, is that we say that the hydrogen atom, or we say that the electron, or the hydrogen atom, is in the ground state. We call this the ground state because this is the lowest energy state, right? It's got the most negative energy. It's the lowest energy state. We call n equal 1 the ground state of the hydrogen atom or the ground state for the electron. We use those terms of the electron or the hydrogen atom interchangeably. Now, what's the significance of this binding energy? And this is important. The significance is that the binding energy is minus the ionization energy for the hydrogen atom. Because if I put the energy, this energy in from here to there into the system, well then I will be ripping off the electron and I'll have a free electron. Right? So the ionization energy is minus the value of this binding energy. The ionization energy is always positive. The binding energy, the way we're going to treat this, the binding energy is going to be negative because the electron is bound, right? And then the separated limit, the electron far away from the nucleus, well, that energy is zero, all right? So the Binding energy is minus the ionization energy, or conversely, the ionization energy is minus the binding energy. That is the physical significance of these binding energies. Right? And when we talk about an ionization energy for an atom, we are typically talking about the ionization energy when the atom is in the ground state. This is the ionization energy we're talking about, all right? All right. 
But we also said that the binding energy of the electron can be this, this much, meaning it's in the n equal 2 state. Right? That can be possible also, not at the same time as it's in the n equal 1 state, but you can have a hydrogen atom in a state, which is the n equal 2 state. What that means is that the electron is bound by less energy. When that's the case, we talk about the hydrogen atom being in the first excited state. This is the ground, this is the first excited state, but n is equal to 2. All right? In that case, the electron is not as strongly bound because it's going to require less energy to rip that electron off. Right? The binding energy in n equal 2 is just the ionization energy or the binding energy in n equal 2 is minus the ionization energy if you have the ionization from the, f if you have a hydrogen atom in the first excited state. All right, make sense to you? Yeah? Okay. So we can have atoms in this state too, then the ionization energy is less. It takes less energy to pull the electron off. Yes, please. Um, in everything that we're going to deal with, we're going to have binding energies that are negative, okay? So uh, let's, let's do that. You can, you can, of course, have a binding energy that's positive, but the problem is that isn't a stable situation, right? Right, okay, okay, good. Other questions? Okay. To the, to the left. Just talk, so I'll find you. <laughs> um, is ionization energy related at all to the Wurz function? Yes, okay. Um, when we're dealing with a solid, we talk about a work function as opposed to an ionization energy. When we're dealing with an atom or a molecule, we talk about an ionization energy as opposed to the work function. It's really the same thing, okay? We just, historically, there's a reason for calling the ionization energy off of a solid, the work function, okay? Okay. Now, oh, one other thing. I just wanted to point out again right here is that when n is equal to infinity, the binding energy is zero. That's the ionization limit, all right? That's when the electron is no longer bound to the uh, nucleus. All right. Now, one other point here is that this solution to the Schrodinger equation for the hydrogen atom, this solution works. It predicts the energy levels, the allowed energy levels for any one electron atom. All right. What do I mean by one electron atom? Well, helium plus is a one electron atom, right? because helium usually has two electrons, but if you take one away, you have only one electron left, and so this helium plus ion, that's a one electron atom, or if you want to say it more precisely, one electron ion, right? or lithium double plus, hey, that's a one electron atom or a one electron uh, ion, because lithium usually has three electrons, but if you took, take two away and you only have one left, hey, that's a one electron atom. Uranium plus 91 is a one electron atom, okay? Because you took 92 of them away, one's left, that's a one electron atom or an ion. And the bottom line is that this expression for the energy levels predicts all of the binding energies for one electron atoms as long as you remember to put in the z squared up here. Okay, for a hydrogen atom, that's of course z equal 1, so we just have minus r sub h over n squared. But for these other one electron atoms, you have to have the z in there, the charge on the nucleus. Why? Well, because that z comes from the potential energy of interaction. The Coulomb potential energy of interaction is the charge on the electron, times z times e, the charge on the nucleus. That's where the z comes from, all right? That's important. Okay, 
So now, how do we know that the Schrodinger equation is making predictions that agree with our observations? Well, we've got to do an experiment. And the experiment we're going to do is we're going to take a glass tube like this. Right? We're going to pump it out. And we're going to fill it with hydrogen, H2. Okay? And then in this glass tube, there are two electrodes, a positive electrode and a negative electrode. And what I'm going to do here is that I'm going to crank up the potential difference between these positive and negative electrodes higher, higher, higher until at a point we're going to have the gas break down. A discharge is going to be ignited just like I'm going to do over here. All right. Did I ignite a discharge? Yep, there it is and the gas is going to glow. We're going to have a plasma formed here. And what we're going to do is we're going to, oh, and what happens in this plasma is that the H2 is broken down into hydrogen atoms. All right? And these hydrogen atoms are going to emit radiation. That's some of the radiation that you're seeing here in this particular discharge lamp. We're going to take that radiation and we're going to disperse it. That is, we're going to send the light through a diffraction grating. This is kind of like the two-slit experiment. And when you look at it, you're going to see constructive and destructive interference. But when you look at the bright spots of constructive interference, you're going to find that those bright spots now are broken down into different colors, purple, blue, green, etc. And that's because the different wavelengths of light have different, or the different colors of light have different wavelengths. And if they have different wavelengths, well, then the points in space of maximum constructive interference are going to be a little different. And so we're going to literally separate the light out in space depending on their colors. And we're going to see what colors come out of this, okay? And so now, in order to help you do that, we've got some diffraction grating glasses for you. You should put them on and, and look into this light. And uh, you will be able to see off to your left and to the right uh, some very distinct lines. OK? And if you look into the lights above, you can see all different colors in the white light. Whoa. All right, you got them all? Very good. Fantastic. All right, great. Right. All right. Do you see the hydrogen lamp? I know that the, the white lights above the room are uh, more interesting because there's a, a real whole rainbow there. All right? Oh, yeah. Okay, I'm going to turn the lamp a little bit since uh, not all of you, if you're way on the side, can see it. All right? So I'm going to start over here. I'm going to turn the lamp a bit. All right? Can you see that now? All right, you should see a bunch of lines here to your left and some to your right. And then, of course, you'll see some up here. But they'll probably be dispersed best to your left and to your right. Pardon? Can we dim the bay lights? Can we, uh, can we dim those big lights over there? Probably not. All right. OK, I'm going to turn it over here. Can you see it? The spectrum that you should see is what I'm showing on the, on the center board there. All right, you see it? Pardon? 
You have to look at the light. Oh, thank you. Hey. Thank you very much. Can you see that better? Yeah. OK, I'll turn it back there. All right. All right, you see the emission spectrum now? It's a little better, huh? Okay, so let's see if we can try to understand this uh, emission spectrum that uh, you're seeing. What you should see, the brightest, what you should see is a purple line. No? Well, let's see. The purple line is actually uh, rather weak, I have to say. If you come really close, you can see it. And you're invited to come up a little bit closer. The purple line's kind of weak. <laughs> what did I do? Oh, I see. Yes, interference phenomena work. Hey, look at that. <laughs> OK, fantastic. All right, so the purple line is kind of weak, but the blue line is really strong, right? And then there's a green line, which is also a little bit weak. And if you, I can see because I'm really close, there's actually, well, I'm not going to tell you that. There's a green line there, and then there's this red line, all right? So let's see if we can uh, understand where these lines are coming from. All right, so what's happening is that this discharge, not only does it pull the H2 apart, break bonds, make hydrogen atoms, but it puts some of those hydrogen atoms into these excited states. And so some, a hydrogen atom might be in this excited state, this initial excited state, high energy state. And of course, that's a high energy state. It's unstable. The system wants to relax. It wants to relax to a lower energy state. All right? And when it does so, because it's going to lower energy state, it has to emit radiation. And that radiation is going to come out as a photon whose energy is exactly the energy difference between these two states. That's the quantum nature here of the hydrogen atom. The photon that comes out has to have an energy delta E, which is exactly the energy of the initial state minus that of the final state. And therefore, the frequency of that radiation is going to have one value given by this energy difference divided by Planck's constant h. So that's what's happening in the discharge. So what we've got is we've got some hydrogen atoms excited to, say, for example, this B state, which is a lower energy state. And so when it relaxes, there's a small energy difference between here and this bottom state. Therefore, you're going to have a low frequency of radiation. If you have some other hydrogen atoms in the discharge that are excited to this state up here, well, this is a big energy difference. And so delta E is going to be large. And therefore, you're going to have some radiation emitted that's at a high frequency because delta E is large. If it's at a high frequency, it's going to have a short wavelength. These hydrogen atoms if, are going to have a low frequency emission. It's going to be a long wavelength. All right? So we've got a mixture of atoms in this state or in this state or in any other states in this discharge. Now, let's try to understand this uh, spectrum. And to do that, I've drawn an energy level diagram for the hydrogen atom. So here's n equal 1 state n equal 2, n equal 3, n equal 4, all the way up to n equals 0 here on the top. They get closer and closer together as we go up. So this purple line, it turns out that that purple line, or the purple color, 
comes from a transition made from a hydrogen atom in the n equal 6 state to the n equal 2 state. The final n here is 2. The blue line comes from a hydrogen atom that has made a transition from n equal 5 also to n equal 2. The, blue, the green line is from a hydrogen atom that makes a transition from n equal 4 to n equal 2. And then the red line from n equal 3 to n equal 2. Of course, the transition from n equal 3 to n equal 2 is the smallest energy. Therefore, it's going to be the longest wavelength. n equal 6 to n equal 2, largest energy. Therefore, it's going to have the smallest wavelength. All right. Now, how do we know that these frequencies agree with what Schrodinger predicted they should be? Well, to know that, what we're going to do is we're going to write down this equation here, which is just telling us what the frequency of the radiation should be. It's delta E over H. But we're going to use the predictions from the Schrodinger equation and plug them into here to calculate what the frequency should be. So we were told here that the energy, say, of the initial state given by the Schrodinger equation is minus r sub h over the initial quantum number squared. We're going to plug that into there. The final state, well, that's also the expression for the energy. We're going to plug that into there. We're then going to rearrange that equation so we get the frequency is the Rydberg constant over h times this quantity 1 over n sub f squared minus 1 over n sub i squared. And since I told you here that all of these lines, the final quantum number is 2, we can plug that in. And then we can just go in and put in 3, 4, 5, 6, and get predictions for what nu is for the frequency. And what you would find is that the predictions that this makes, the Schrodinger equation makes, agree with the observations of the frequencies of these lines to 1 part in 10 to the 8th. There is really just remarkable agreement between the energies or the frequencies predicted by Schrodinger's uh, equation and what we actually observe for the hydrogen atom. Okay, so here's another diagram of the energies of the hydrogen atom, n equal 1, n equal 2, n equal 3. And the four lines that we were looking at are shown right here. Okay, these are the four lines. Here's n equal 6 to n equal 2, n equal 5 to n equal 2. These lines are actually called the Balmer series. I want you to note that there is also a transition from n equal 6 to n equal 1. It's over here. But you can see that that transition is a very high energy transition. That transition occurs in the ultraviolet range of the electromagnetic spectrum. And therefore, you can't see it, but it's there. And actually what you can see is that there are transitions from these higher energy states to the ground state, the transitions from all of them to the ground state, but they're all in the ultraviolet range of the electromagnetic spectrum. That's why you can't see that right now. But those lines are called the Lyman series. And then there are transitions here to the n equal 3 state. Right? These transitions from the larger quantum number to n equal 3 are called the passion series. They occur in the, the um, uh, uh, near infrared. Bracket series in the infrared. Fun series in the far infrared. I got that backwards. Um, and these different series are all labeled by the final state. And they're labeled by the names of the discoverers. And uh, the reason there's so many different discoverers is because in order to see this different kinds of in, in, uh, radiation, you have to have a different kind of detector. And depending on what kind of detector an experimentalist had, well, that depends on, uh, uh, that will dictate then what uh, he actually can see, what kind of radiation, what, uh, which ones of these transitions he can view. 
All right? Okay. Now, we looked at emission. But it is also possible for there to be absorption between these allowed states of a hydrogen atom. That is, we can have a hydrogen atom here in a low energy state, the initial state, E sub i. And if there is a photon around whose energy matches the energy difference between these two states, well, then that photon can be absorbed by the hydrogen atom. Okay? So again, the energy of that photon has to be exactly the difference in energy between those two states. It can't be a little larger. If it's a little larger, hey, that photon isn't going to be absorbed. That's important. That's the quantum nature, again, of the hydrogen atom. These, there are specific energies that are allowed and nothing in between. And then from knowing the energy of the photon, you can get that frequency. And then in the case of absorption, the frequencies of which the frequencies of the radiation that can be absorbed by a hydrogen atom are given by this expression. This expression differs from the frequencies for emission only in that I've reversed these two terms. This is 1 over n sub i squared. This is 1 over n sub f squared. I've reversed them so that you come out with a frequency that is a positive number. Frequencies do have to be positive, all right? Okay, so we've got two different expressions here for the frequency, depending on whether we're absorbing a photon or we're emitting a photon, all right? Okay, questions? Can't see anybody. There. Epsilon naught is a conversion factor for electrostatic units. That is all you need at the moment. All right. In 802, maybe you will go through the unit conversion there all right, to get you to MKS, uh, SI units.